Our leadership has met and we have discussed and prayed of when we can gather again together. And we have collectively said, let's wait until June at the earliest. So we will continue our online services through May and we'll start looking at what it um, will entail to uh, start meeting together. Uh, even then, we will probably continue our online services for those who are at risk and just who don't feel comfortable being in public yet, and we understand that. There's no condemnation for those who come or for those who don't come for whatever reasons you deem uh, necessary in your own heart and mind. But uh, nevertheless, some of us would like to gather here together and begin worshiping, and, and uh, we'll take the proper steps to ensure safety um, as we have in-person worship um, hopefully in the near future, but we'll just wait and see. So thank you for your patience and your understanding uh, in this time. You can continue to support Walnut Creek, its uh, mission, its missionaries, uh, our ministries uh, by online giving. The link is provided for you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, you're keeping us more than afloat, and we are doing very well. And when we are able to gather together, we will be able to do full-fledged ministries uh, again because of your generosity. There are other things going on during the week you can go to wcpc.org, and there's a lineup of weekly gatherings via Zoom uh, where you can join small groups, uh, Bible studies, and gatherings. So um, please tune in for those, and we'll try to connect uh, the best we can during this time. Let's move to the hearing the reading and the preaching of God's Word. We have been in a series studying the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts chronicles the expanse of Christianity from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world. And the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to redeem people and grant them new and eternal life could not be condemned, can, could not be contained, and it spread like a pandemic. That same gospel, the message of Jesus' life and death on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, and giving us His goodness, that same gospel message continues to transform lives today and throughout the entire world. So our, we, the church, we are learning from Acts how to become messengers or missionaries of that gospel in our changing culture. Listen to what Thomas Chalmers says about being a missionary. Every man is a missionary, now and forever, for good or for evil, whether he intends or designs it not. He may be a blot radiating his dark influence outward to the very circumference of society, or he may be a blessing spreading benediction over the length and breadth of the world, but a blank he cannot be. There are no moral blanks. There are no neutral characters. How interesting. Every person is a missionary, whether for good 
or for evil, whether intentionally or unintentionally. How everyone lives their lives is a message to others. Our passage today is Acts 20. And let's see how the gospel message is spread at that time. And we're going to learn a very practical way to be a missionary for good in our culture. Acts chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. And he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, son of Purus, accompanied him. Of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us, Paul and Luke, at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, and we stayed there seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, taking him up in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and we went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we touched at Samos, and then day after that we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so he might have not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost." Now from Miletus he set, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold... I, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. And therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, wolves, uh, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the grace of his word, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus. Now he himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. There's a lot going on in this chapter, and I wanted to read the entire thing. We've got Paul encouraging people. He's traveling all over the place. He's got a huge entourage. He's preaching late at night, and he's preaching so long that a young man falls asleep sitting in the, uh, the windowsill, probably because of the cool air, and he, he falls out and dies. Paul goes down, heals him, brings him back to life, and what does he do? He goes back, serves communion, and keeps preaching until daylight. I'm glad we don't have a windowsill here at Walnut Creek. I put a few people to sleep myself. I know what Paul has done. He travels around. He's moving. He sends for the Ephesian uh, elders, and he kind of gives him his last words and says goodbye to them. There's a lot going on here. But this chapter begins with Paul doing something very significant twice. In verse 1, it says, after encouraging them. And then while traveling in verse 2, given them much encouragement. One of my favorite words in the New Testament is paraclete. One who comes alongside to help. Someone who helps us cope, helps us get through whatever we're going through. One who encourages another. That's the Greek word used for encouragement in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 20. Paul is being a paraclete. Now, I know you all have missed the sermon in the box. If you're not familiar at Walnut Creek, we have a children's sermon. Somebody has brought a box. They've placed one object in it from their home. We open it up, and I do an, an extemporaneous children's sermon, uh, a parable, have you. Well, I know you all are missing it, not just you kids, but you adults. So I brought a box today, and we're going to do a sermon in the box within the sermon. So what I have in this box is what? We have here a pair of shoes. But if I turn these shoes over, what do you see now? They have nubs on them. They're called cleats. So now I have a pair of cleats. I know you're groaning right now. Bad dad joke, Steve. I want to let you know that one of my pair of cleats, one of my encouragers, Stan Ott, the very pastor that married Tammy and I, over 30 years ago used the same illustration when he talked about it. I never forgot it. I never will. And now, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, you will never forget this either. A pair of cleats. Every athlete who plays on a grass or artificial grass service, surface or field wears a pair of cleats. Because a pair of cleats helps provide traction. It gives people a more sure footing as they are on the field. The word paraclete used twice in Acts 20, in 20 is translated encouragement or encourager. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the word paraclete is also translated as helper, advocate, counselor, comforter, intercessor. Literally, a paraclete is one who comes alongside another to help them, to give them better footing, traction where they're slipping or have slipped. A paraclete, someone who comes alongside to help, they help us cope, help us get through whatever we're going through. The term paraclete describes the very character of God. 
God the Father is our paraclete. Listen to first, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, paraclesis. Jesus, the Son, is our paraclete. John, 1 John 2.1 says this, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, paraclete, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Holy Spirit is our paraclete. Jesus said in John 14, 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, a paraclete, to be with you forever. So the whole Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is our paraclete, who they love to come alongside us to help us. God's very character is one to be alongside of you. Because the God who loves you is your paraclete. We see Paul all throughout Acts 20 being a paraclete, an encourager, a counselor, an advocate, a helper, an exhorter. Because a paraclete is with people. Paul is constantly alongside people. In verse 4, look at all the people that Paul is traveling with. Sopater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychicus, and Trophimus, and Luke. He is with people because paracletes come alongside people. But they just don't come alongside in presence. A paraclete exhorts and entreaties people. Paul testifies to the gospel of his Uh, of the grace of God in verse 24. He calls people to repentance in faith in verse 21, and he declares the whole counsel of God in verse 27. He exhorts and entreats people to believe in Jesus so that they may be saved and healed and transformed and redeemed. A paraclete cares for people. In verses 28 and 29, Paul instructs the elders to be paracletes by caring for the flock or the people of the church and protecting the flock from wolves. Paraclete is also a comforter, one who shows empathy. And we see in verse 31 that Paul sheds tears of grief as he says his goodbyes and he knows that it's breaking the hearts of others that he will no longer visit them again. Finally, a paraclete helps the weak and is generous with those in need. And we see that in verse 35. In the same way, you and I are sent to be paracletes to the people in our lives. We are sent to come alongside them to offer help, encouragement, and presence. A paraclete has the eyes of Jesus to see the people around you like Jesus sees them. A paraclete sees and feels and acts like Jesus sees and feels and acts around people. So I ask you, to whom is God sending you? How can you be in a, a paraclete or a ma- more effective paraclete for them. The key to care is to be there. And your words of encouragement can give them a better footing in life. Now, our current stay-at-home, semi-quarantine situation due to coronavirus may mean some creativity on your part to be a paraclete. Uh, Don't undervalue the power of a simple phone call or a text message. How are you doing? How can I pray for you? You may not be able to physically come alongside someone, but you can in other ways. I know it sounds almost archaic in our Instagram, Twitter, TikTok world, but there's comforting power with a note. Over the past 60 days, I've received more handwritten thank you notes than I've received in the past four years combined. 
they have been a great encouragement to me. And you who have been thanking uh, our leadership, our staff, Jonathan and Jessen, myself and our team, that's been a great encouragement to us. You have been paracletes by writing a handwritten note that simply says thank you for your efforts. Our extended family uh, has enjoyed a few Zoom calls together in this coronavirus time. They're sort of like a, a mini family reunion where we all check in with each other and we share stories. And you know what? We have found them to be very comforting to see each other, even though it might be a video screen, and to, and to um, check in with how everyone's doing. That's coming alongside your family. You know, maybe you might review in your own life and thank God for the paracletes in your own life, the people who love you, the people who guide you when things are tough, the people who put steel in your backbone when you have been afraid, 